Okay, so um, I'm starting a new book. I like to read every morning or every every day. It doesn't have to be the morning. I like to read something inspirational. Um, so I picked up this book, The Five People We Meet in Heaven, at um, <clears throat> at Goodwill, and was it Goodwill? Yes, it was Goodwill. And um, they had a few copies, but I liked this one because it has a message from somebody who previously owned it. And it says, I hope you like the book, Mom, Jan 04. Um, so I thought that was really cute. So um, this book, I really don't know what it's about. I just know that it's a popular book and a lot of people um, talk about it. Okay, so it says, this book is dedicated to Edward something. Um, <laughs> my beloved uncle who gave me my first concept of heaven. Okay, so it's about heaven. Duh. <laughs> Every year around the Thanksgiving table, he spoke of a night in the hospital when he awoke to see the souls of his departed loved ones sitting on the edge of the bed, waiting for him. I never forgot that story, and I never forgot him. Everyone has an idea of heaven, as do most religions, and they should all be respected. The version represented here is only a guess, a wish in some ways that my uncle and others like him, people who felt unimportant here on earth, realized finally how much they mattered and how they were loved. Um, I'm Christian. Um, I know there's a heaven and, um, you know, like this book says, um, you should respect all religions, all faiths, whatever people believe in. Um, you know, I have an idea of what heaven looks like. Um, and I kind of got that idea from The Lovely Bones, that the movie The Lovely Bones. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it has this scene at the end. Um, I'm not going to spoil it for you, of, of heaven. Um, so if you're struggling to kind of relate to what heaven looks like, um... I would recommend watching that movie. It's amazing. It's sad, but it's also beautiful at the same time. Um, so check that out if if you're struggling with heaven. Okay, I'm just going to read the first page and then I plan to just read it um, a little bit every day. So the first page says the end. This is a story about a man named Eddie and it begins at the end with Eddie dying in the sun. It might seem strange to start a story with an ending, but all things are also beginnings. Very true. We just don't know it at the time. Very, very true. Um, very true. So when I went through a separation, that's exactly how to describe it. The last hour of Eddie's life was spent like most of the others at Ruby Pier, an amusement park by a great ocean. The park had the usual attractions, a boardwalk, a Ferris wheel, roller coasters, bumper cars, a taffy stand, an arcade where you could shoot streams of water into a clown's mouth. It also had a big new ride called Freddy's Freefall, and this would be where Eddie would be killed in an accident that would make newspapers around the state. At the time of his death, Eddie was a squat, white-haired old man with a short neck, a barrel chest, thick forearms, and a faded army tattoo on his right shoulder. His legs were thin and veined now, and his left knee, wounded in the war, was ruined by arthritis. He used a cane to get around. His face was broad and groggy from the sun, with salty whiskers and a lower jaw that protruded slightly, making him look prouder than he felt. He kept a cigarette behind his left ear and a ring of keys hooked to his belt. He wore rubber soles. He wore an old lineup cap, his pale brown uniform suggested a working man and a working man he was eddie's job was maintaining the rides which really meant keeping them safe every afternoon he walked the park checking on each attraction from the tilt world to the pipeline plunge he looked for broken boards loose bolts worn out steel sometimes he would stop his eyes glazing over and people walking past thought something was wrong but he was listening, that's all. After these years, he could hear trouble. He sat in the spits and stutters and thrumming of the equipment. 
Within 15 minutes left on earth, Eddie took his last walk along Ruby Pier. He passed an elderly couple. Folks, he mumbled, touching his cap. They nodded politely. Customers knew Eddie, at least the regular ones did. They saw him summer after summer. One of those faces you associate with a place. His work shirt had a patch on the chest that read Eddie above the word maintenance. And sometimes they would say, hiya, Eddie maintenance, although he never thought that was funny. Today, it so happened, was Eddie's birthday, his 83rd. A doctor last week had told him he had shingles. Shingles? Eddie didn't even know what they were. Once he had been strong enough to lift a carousel horse in each arm. That was a long time ago. Eddie, take me, Eddie, take me. 40 minutes until his death, Eddie made his way to the front of the roller coaster line. He rode every attraction at least once a week. To be certain, the brakes and steering were solid. Today was coaster day, the ghoster coaster. They called this one, and the other kids who knew Eddie yelled to get in the cart with him. Children liked Eddie, not strangers, or not teenagers. Teenagers gave him headaches. Over the years, Eddie figured he'd seen every sort of do-nothing, snarl-at-you teenager was. But children were different. Children looked at Eddie, who with his protruding lower jaw always seemed to be grinning, like a dolphin, and they trusted him. They drew in like cold hands to a fire. They hugged his leg, they played with his keys. Eddie, Eddie mostly grunted, never saying much. He figured it was because he didn't say much that they liked him. Now Eddie tapped two little boys with backward baseball caps. They raced to the car and tumbled in. Eddie handed his cane to the ride attendant and slowly lowered himself between the two. Here we go, here we go. One boy squealed as the other pulled Eddie's arm around his shoulder. Eddie lowered the lap bar and clack, 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 up they went. A story went around about Eddie. When he was a boy growing up by this very same pier, he got in an alley fight. Five kids from Pitkin Avenue had cornered his brother, Joe, and were about to give him a beating. Eddie was a block away on a stoop eating a sandwich. He heard his brother scream. He ran to the alley, grabbed a garbage can lid, and sent two boys to the hospital. After that, Joe didn't talk to him for months. He was ashamed. Joe was the oldest, the firstborn, but it was Eddie who did the fighting. Can we go again, Eddie, please? 34 minutes to live, Eddie lifted the lap bar, gave each boy a sucking candy, retrieved his cane, then limped to the maintenance shop to cool down from the summer heat. He had known his death was imminent. He might have gone somewhere else. If he had known his death was imminent, he might have gone somewhere else. Instead, he did what, he, what we all do. He went about his dull routine as if all the days in the world were still to come. One of the shop workers, a lanky, bony young man named Dominguez, was by the solvent sink, wiping grease off a wheel. Yo, Eddie, he said. Dom, Eddie said. The shop smelled like sawdust. It was dark, cramped with a low ceiling, pegboard walls that held drills and saw and hammers. Skeleton parts of fun park rides were everywhere. Compressors, engines, belts, light bulbs, the type top of a pirate's head, stack against one of... One wall were coffee cans of nails and screws, and stacked against another were, were wall endless tub, tubs of grease. Greasing a truck, Eddie would say, required no more brains than washing a dish. The only difference was you got dirtier as you did, not cleaner. And that was the sort of work that Eddie did. Spread grease, adjusted brakes, tightened bolts, checked electrical panels. Many times he had longed to leave this place, find different work, building other kind of lights. But the war came. His plans never worked out. In time, he found himself graying and wearing loser pants, looser pants, and in a state of wary acceptance that this was who he was and who he would always be. A man with sand in his shoes in a world of mechanical laughter and grilled frankfurters. Like his father before him, like the patch on his shirt, Eddie was maintenance, the head of maintenance. Or as the kids sometimes called him, the ride man at Ruby Pier. 30 minutes left. Ha hey, happy birthday, I hear Dominguez said. Eddie grunted. No party or nothing? 
Addie looked at him if he were crazy. For a moment, he thought how strange it was to be growing old in a place that smelled of cotton candy. Well, remember, Eddie, I'm off next week, starting Monday, going to Mexico. Eddie nodded, and Dominguez did a little dance. Me and Teresa, going to see the whole family. Party! He stopped dancing when he noticed Eddie staring. Have you ever been, Dominguez said? Been? To Mexico. Eddie exhaled through his nose. Kid, I've never been anywhere. I wasn't shipped with a rifle. He watched Dominguez return to the sink. He thought for a moment. Then he took a small wad of bills from his pocket and removed the only 20s he had, two of them. He held them out. Get your wife something nice, Eddie said. Dominguez regarded the money, broke into a huge smile and said, Come on, man. You sure? Eddie pushed the money into Dominguez's palm. Then he walked back to the storage area. A small shipping hole had been cut into boardwalk planks years ago, and Eddie lifted the plastic cap. He tugged on nylon line that had dropped 80 feet to the sea. A piece of bologna was still attached. We catch anything, Dominguez yelled. Tell me we caught something. Eddie wondered how the guy could be so optimistic. There was never anything on that line. One day, Dominguez yelled, we're going to get halibut. Yep, Eddie mumbled, although he knew you could never pull a fish that big through a hole that small. Okay, so I will continue tomorrow. The next um, paragraph is 26 minutes um, left to live.